Hi, I'm Larry Hoffman. I'm an attorney in Bridgeport, and we're in my office here at 10 Middle Street in the heart of downtown Bridgeport. I was born in Bridgeport in 1948. My father, before him, was born in Bridgeport in 1906. And the godfather of my family, Michael Hoffman, was born in Russia in 1878 and moved to Bridgeport in 1888 and promptly got married to my grandmother, Ida Kasdan. Uh, and they raised a big, bustling family of six kids, four uh, boys and two women. My grandfather started a pushcart business where he had loose pieces of coal that he would sell to people to keep their houses warm. And he worked himself up to having a big oil company in Bridgeport. He, my father and his three brothers manned the, the coal business in Bridgeport in the, starting in the early 1900s and going right up to 1961 when they sold the business. My father was a very hard working man and he picked that habit up from his father. There was a story that was told that during World War, during World War I, a woman called, however you called in those days, uh, a woman called my father and asked for a coal delivery, my grandfather, and asked for a coal delivery. So my grandfather got a bucket of coal, put it on the back of his horse, went to the woman's house, climbed five st sets of stairs to get to the top of the house where, she, where my father met the woman who had called for the coal. And this was a big purchase in those days. Uh, of, uh, however it was measured out, it was a big purchase. And my grandfather was very was a very kind and gentle and tender man. And when the woman, when my, father, my grandfather got to her house, the woman said, wait here, I'll go into the bedroom and come out with the money that I owe you. And when she left the, the living room to go to get the money that she owed my grandfather, my grandfather snuck out the back door. He was, he couldn't take the money. And he, apparently he was crying as he was walking down the stairs because he, he had seen so much horror in Europe, and my father, who was born in the United States uh, and educated in the United States, who went to Harvard, uh, which he never forgot the opportunity that was bestowed upon him. His first day of school, he was six years old, his first day of school at the Beersley School, where all six Hoffman siblings went at one time, five at one time, six all together. At, at recess, the first day of school, he walked home. He didn't realize that there was, this was recess, and he, he, nobody, nobody stopped him, so he just picked himself up at lunchtime and walked home. To, his mother said, you don't come home for lunch. This is America, you, still, you stay and work the whole day. It was a lesson my father never forgot. And he worked very hard, never went to the gym, never went to Florida, just raised his family uh, and was the tater familias, as we used to call him. He was, the, he was the godfather. He was the oldest of his siblings and He was, he was a very hardworking and lovely man. They used to say about my father, he was equally comfortable with bank presidents and day laborers. My father oftentimes had coal dust in his fingernails by the end of the day. And his one indulgence on a Sunday 
after having worked six and a half days on a Sunday, he and his and his whoever he could round up went to downtown Bridgeport, where they had a spritz bath. It's old, an old Jewish tradition. It's a spritz bath. They put you in the sauna and they whip you with reeds and <laughs> until you get up a sweat and you're drinking schna schnapps, which nobody knows what it is. I don't even know what it is. But it's... <laughs> Here it comes in peach. <laughs> yeah, peach schnapps. <laughs> Here's the, the next generation, namely me and my wife Joy on the sailboat. I'm going to show you over here the, to the Hall of Fame. These are my great-grandparents, Jacob and Rhoda, whom, 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 whom I never met, but they're legendary in our family. This was the opening of a new Calso gas station. Calso being short for California Standard Oil. And here was my grandfather who was proud as if he had a new baby. He opened a new gas station. Mm -hmm. And his right hand man, my father, Maury Hoffman, my uncle Sidney Hoffman, my uncle Burton, uh, Harold Hoffman, and there were a couple others scattered around and about. The key point of the deal from the Standard Oil of, of California point of view was they wanted to keep my father's name. They wanted to keep the name Hoffman Fuel, and they did. And my father would get phone calls in the middle of the night 30 and 40 years later after he hadn't, after he'd sold the business 30 or 40 years previous. He would get calls in the middle of the night saying, I don't have, I, I don't have heat and my babies are cold and my father, who hadn't, hadn't owned the business in 30 or 40 years, said, I'll take care of it. Huh. He called headquarters of the new oil company, when I say new, I mean 30 or 40 years old, and said, there's a woman at such and such address who needs oil, and why don't you take care of that woman right now? And my father had no authority. He wasn't his business anymore, but he was so uh, sincere and had built up such a reputation that when he called Hoffman Fuel 30 or 40 years later, they responded to him and took care of him. Which one's your father again? This is my father, Maurice Jerome Hoffman. My, grandfa my grandfather, my grandmother, and my wife's, this is my wife, Joy. Beautiful girl, married in 1990. I better not forget that one. Her father, who was my father-in-law, Roy Friedman, was put in business by my grandfather, Michael Hoffman. So the two sides of the family knew each other back from the early 1900s. And in those days, you, you didn't compete with your lancemen. You helped your lancemen. Lancemen is the Yiddish term for people from the same land as you, people from the same country. So when you, came, when you came over from Russia, you sought out the people who your family knew from the old country. And, and there, was, there was no competition. My, my father-in-law's father was not was not looking for uh, a handout. He just wanted to work. And my grandfather sold him an oil truck, and which today you would never do. You would try to you would try to freeze out the uh, the competition. But in those days, you worked with your lancemen, and you looked out for them, and helped establish another family in Bridgeport. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is my father at his college reunion, and he would take me along because he was proud of me. And my father was the loving, kind, decent man who made a lot of money 
but not through any devious means and not through uh, not through any making any serious inventions or discovering the internet. You didn't do any of that. He just shook your hand and made a deal. And even he made some deals that way with people who were less than honorable. And I would suggest to him that maybe we shouldn't be doing a deal with this person because they've got a negative rep reputation. My father said, we're going to take the old window windshield test. And I said, what's the windshield test? He said, we'll drive by and take a look and we'll know if this is someone we want to do business with or not. And he was right much more often than he was wrong. People were making money. This was post-World War II. And the family had expanded. Uh, and people wanted to know how come your wife is driving a, a Ford and my wife is only driving a Volkswagen. There was a lot of potential for unrest. And my father, who had wanted to be a rabbi uh, when he came over from the old country, he had rabbinical, a rabbinical bent, but his father couldn't afford to send him to rabbinical school. He needed him in the business. But my father was a, basically a de facto rabbi. People would come to him with questions or problems. This family isn't getting along with, with there's a friction between members of the family. They would go to my father, who would sit down with them and talk th through the problem. And my father would come up with a solution. You know, when we earlier filmed my, my father and my grandfather, who didn't belong to the gym, by the time we got to my generation, we were at the gym. <laughs> I became a, uh, a pretty good, a pretty good uh, marathon swimmer. This is a picture of me swimming the 28 and a half miles around Manhattan, uh, of which I'm pretty proud, I must say. The older I get, the more proud I get. Here's, here's me at the starting line. I haven't seen this picture in a long time. Hmm. Here's right. one of the most interesting, probably the most interesting character I ever met in my whole life, Ben Kramer, a Holocaust survivor and marathon swim champion swum 18 times around Manhattan. And by the way, I should mention that he's autistic, which makes him one in a zillion. June 1995, with the, with the, with the uh, World Trade Center towers in the background. So it gives you a little idea of, of when this was taken. This was done it, you can see all the lanol, all the lanolin on my body. It takes about three or four hours to put all that lanolin on. My friend Ben, whom I referred to earlier, used to put on bearskin oil. Uh, the rumor is that he killed his own bear. And as outrageous as it sounds, I believe that it's true. Anyway, I swam around New York. I ended up at the World Trade Center. The, uh, it took hours and hours to put the lanolin on and more hours to take it off, but it was worth it. I was in the water for 11 and a half hours. What is lanolin exactly? It's, it's like motor oil. It's <laughs> thick, and it insulates you from the cold. And the, the water wasn't that cold, but when you were in it for 11 and a half hours, it tended to make you cold. I'm a little hard to recognize these days. <laughs> I just found this ruler which advertised the Hoffman Fuel Company on East Washington Avenue in Bridgeport. Uh, there, were no, there were no area codes in those days, just the phone number, 367-6641. And it's a wonderful wow. Hoffman Fuel Company. It's a wonderful uh, dipstick. It's a wonderful reminder of a wonderful time. Here's me getting ready to swim Candlewood Lake. I swam it 11 times. I'm the, no one will ever break the record 
the swimming came to Wood Lake 11 times because they canceled the swim after my 11th time. Those were great days. Those were great days. <laughs>